Hi, everybody. Good afternoon, and welcome to our 12th annual Wild Wisconsin Winter Web Conference. I'm Jamie Machik with the Wisconsin Valley Library Service, Service, also the conference coordinator, and I am moderating the marketing track today, and assisting me is Kelly Miller from the Winding Rivers Library System. So thank you, Kelly. Uh, we had a great session at 1030 on color theory, and we're continuing that, um, talking about storytelling and how it can impact our libraries and, and promote our advocacy efforts. And we have Kirsten Hill with us for this session. And she is the Director of Nonprofit Solutions for Spire Spring. And she is located um, in uh, just outside of Lincoln, Nebraska. So Kirsten, whenever you're ready. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It is wonderful to be with you guys. Uh, I do want to say that uh, librarians are some of my most favorite people. I love reading. I um, I read I, what I think for me is a fair amount. Uh, I'm a mostly exclusive romance reader. Uh, and I even have a book blog where I talk about romance books. So I feel like I am with my people today. So so uh, great to be with you and to and to talk a little bit about how we can tell stories about stories. So uh, great to be with you all. Again, I'm Kirsten Hill. I'm the director of nonprofit solutions at a company called Fire Spring. We are located in Lincoln, Nebraska. That's where our headquarters is located. I'm coming to you today from just outside of Lincoln. Uh, we, however, have an office in Omaha as well, which is uh, my colleague Chessa is in the chat and with us today. She is in Omaha. And we have clients in all 50 states in the US and in 11 countries internationally. So we always say that FireSpring does a whole lot from right here in the middle of everywhere. FireSpring provides strategic guidance that is activated through creative solutions in marketing, printing, and technology. Uh, and our goal though is always to help businesses and nonprofits to prosper. FireSpring is the first certified B Corporation in the state of Nebraska, which means that we are certified for public benefit. And the way that we express that public benefit is through what we call the power of three. So FireSpring is committed to donating a minimum of 1% of our profits. The top line revenue gets donated every year to nonprofit organizations. 2% of our products get donated through in-kind product and service donations and 3% of our people. So every full-time employee at FireSpring, myself, Chessa, anybody who works at FireSpring, not only receives eight hours every single month, but we're expected to use eight hours every single month to volunteer for the nonprofit and charitable organizations of our choice. So as a company, FireSpring is really committed to leveraging our people, our products, and our profits to do more good. Today, we are going to talk about storytelling for impact. This is one of my most favorite topics. Uh, it is actually a subject that we have a number of different training sessions available for. Uh, and uh, today, we're going to talk uh, specifically a general overview of what storytelling is and how you can do it. If you are posting on social media today, you can use the hashtag powered by purpose. You can tag us at FireSpring. If you don't know what, um, what, how to post on social media, you don't know what a hashtag is, that is a whole separate webinar that is not going to be covered today. Uh, and you can drop a note in the in the chat or the Q&A and we can get you a link to a recent recording or get you signed up for an upcoming session of Social Media 101 if you need that. But today in this session, we are going to talk about what is storytelling and why it's important. I'm going to go over seven benefits that we've identified for nonprofit storytelling. We're going to talk about how to create your brand voice and the tone that you use to talk about your library. We're going to talk about the seven elements of great stories, how to do storytelling in action. So I'm going to show you some examples uh, of how people do good storytelling. We're going to go through 12 ways that you can really up your storytelling game. And I'm going to wrap up with an act, some action steps, and I'm going to try and leave about 10 minutes at the end for Q&A, uh, and you can ask questions. If you have questions in the meantime, you can throw those in the questions panel, you can throw them in the chat, uh, and I'll get to those probably uh, closer to the end. So that uh, lets you know what's happening there. 
So first of all, what is storytelling? I want to make sure that we are all on the same page. We all know what we're talking about when we're talking about storytelling. And it is really an art. Uh, and it's the art of sharing a narrative. But our goal with storytelling is always to engage our audience. We want to deliver messages and information and knowledge, but we want to do it in a subtle and entertaining way. Uh, you know, I think some of the best stories are the ones that, you know, educate or inform us. Uh, but it doesn't even feel like we're we're getting, you know, the the lecture or the education. It's it's just sort of delivered in this way that feels natural and organic. And that's what we want to do. Uh, and I do think it's sort of meta that you guys are going to be telling stories about stories, uh, but uh, but also very cool at the same time. So seven benefits to nonprofit storytelling. The first reason why you want to do good storytelling is because storytelling allows you as an organization to share the truth about who you are and what you do. And boy, I think in days when libraries and books in general are coming under of uh, such scrutiny and and you know such uh, sort of fervor in in the public some in certain segments of the public and the media, I think we want to do everything we can to really share the truth about what libraries are all about and what your organizations are all about. And so if you're looking for good examples of how to share your truth, uh, I always recommend Charity Water and this story in particular. So this story is, it's an older one. It's actually um, the, the story of Helen. Helen was first introduced to Charity Water and vice versa back around one, uh, 2009. So this is an older story, but last I knew this was still on the Charity Water, Charity Water website. Say that 10 times fast. So <laughs> Helen is, um, is really this story that is about what a difference it made for Helen to have a well, a water well in her, in her village, in her community. Um, and there's a lot of statistics and things in this story. So the average American family of four uses 400 gallons of water a day, and Helen's family was divvying up just 10 gallons. But as you go through the story, it really becomes about how the water and access to water changed Helen as a person. And one of the things that she says is that having access to clean water for the first time in her life made her feel beautiful. Mm. And I think, wow, I mean, when we are, when we are, you know, thinking about the impact that we're having, who would have ever imagined that that would be the impact that it, that that had for her. And I will tell you, I've given this presentation a lot. I can never remember the 400 gallons or who uses what, but I will never forget the fact that access to water made Helen feel beautiful. And those are the kinds of impacts that we can have our that we can have on people when we share our stories. And it really does share the truth about who we are and the work that we are doing. At the same time, we are also establishing relationships and we are drawing people in to the work that we do. Uh, there is nothing that connects people together more than telling and sharing stories. While we're drawing people together, we are also setting ourselves apart. Uh, I've had the, the great pleasure of working with, at this point, literally hundreds of organizations uh, across the country and even worldwide. I was working with a, a group this morning out of Uganda. Uh, and I will tell you that I've never met two organizations that have the exact same founding story. So even though you may all be libraries, you may all be you know, in a, in a similar geographic area, um, the way that your organizations came about, the work that you do, it's all going to be unique and different. And how you operate as as a, a library is probably going to be different than how someone else operates as a library. And so those are the things that when you tell those stories, you're setting yourself apart. You are establishing yourself as different from all of the other organizations and all of the other charities that are out there. At the same time that we're setting ourselves apart, we're also driving action. So research has found that the same parts of our brain that light up when they hear a story. So we've we've taken, you know, we've tested people, we've hooked them up to the electrodes, we're testing what sections of their brain light up 
when they hear different things or they take different actions. Um, the sections of the brain that light up when people hear a narrative story are the same sections of the brain that drive people to take action. So when we are telling a story, we are automatically feeding into the natural brain pathways that drive people to take action. So if you want people to raise money, if you want to increase website conversions or educate people, build trust, you want people to subscribe to your newsletter, volunteer, register for an event, whatever it is, when you tell a narrative story, you are connecting to those same pe brain pathways that drive that call to action. Uh, and so that's why having a clear call to action is such an important part of your stories. Stories at the same time inform, it should inform everything that we are doing. I think about a story as being like a, the set of Russian nesting dolls. Um, and, you know, the, the dolls, you open them up. And when you open them, there's a smaller doll and you open it up, there's a smaller doll and you get all the way down to the middle. And in the center of the doll is a tiny little seed. Um, and, and I think about that seed as being the stories that we are sharing on behalf of our organizations. And so everything that we do builds from that seed, that story at the center. The way that we talk about ourselves online or when people come into our, our organizations, uh, the way that we are uh, exposing, you know, and, and exposing people to the work that we do, that they're, they're experiencing our brands and our organizations. All of those things should really come from story at the center. Uh, it is so critical to how we talk about ourselves and our organizations and then how we extend the reach. So when we tell great stories, we're really pushing that reach out, whether it's through our websites or social media content that we're sharing or if we're buying buying even social media advertising, or we're uh, issuing press releases, or sending mail, or point of sale, even to the point of visual merchandise. Almost every time I give a presentation for Firespring, I wear a Firespring t-shirt. And that is very much my way to continue to extend our Firespring brand. It, it tells you the fire spring story uh, to some extent. And, and I think all, everything that we are doing comes from the story of who we are at the very center. And finally, it helps us to build our personality. So when you're thinking about your organization, you really want to think about what kind of personality your organization has. What do you do? What does it take for you to do it well? And what do you want to be known for? And and I think that when we are thinking about our personality and what we want to be known for, it is so much more than just a place to go check out books, right? There, there's so much more that goes into it. And there are ways that we can communicate really subtly, almost, uh, almost subconsciously uh, to our audiences through how we talk about ourselves, not just what we say, but how do we say it? So this is an example on the right of an archetyping wheel. If I have any folks in the room who were, uh, were marketing majors in college, you've probably seen the archetyping wheel. Uh, this is, again, kind of the, that subtle uh, subconscious way that we talk about ourselves. And so let, I'll give you a couple of examples. Fire Spring, for instance, we are the creator archetype. We use innovation in order to help people provide structure to their world. And so when I think about how we talk about ourselves at Firespring, whether we are showing a really cool print project that we just completed or a beautiful new website that someone has or a really great marketing uh, campaign that we came up with, we are all about creating and using that creativity to help our clients have structure to their world and to help people, you know, promote and talk about themselves. And so you know, that we lean into that kind of messaging, that creativity and innovation. Uh, and I think if you would go out and follow Firespring on any of our social medias, you would see, or, you know, if you get emails from us or, or mailings uh, from us, you would see how we really espouse that creator archetype. I've worked with another nonprofit organization that's based out of San Diego, California, called Solutions for Change. And Solutions for Change sees themselves as the hero archetype. And as the hero archetype, 
they use mastery to leave their mark on the world. The way that they do that is that they really talk about changing all of the systems that are built around supporting the homeless. And they talk about how they want to defeat the churn, how they do things differently than anyone else, um, how their model and approach is superior to any other kind of service that is provided for homeless in their area. And they really lean into that archetype. Um, now, just because you're all libraries doesn't necessarily mean that you're all going to fit the same archetype. Uh, somebody might be the hero archetype. You might talk about how you leave a mark on the world through, you know, the the liberation, right? Through books and 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 freedom to read and freedom to access information. You might lean into that outlaw, or maybe you're an organization who is about, you know, understanding and that yearn for for understanding the yearn for paradise. You're more of the sage, so. Even though you're similar organizations, how you talk about yourself and how you view yourself as an organization is going to change. And so you or is going to be different. It's not necessarily going to change, but it's going to be different from organization to organization. But it's important that everybody spend some time thinking about who you are and how you want to talk about yourselves, uh, because that's going to help you to really build your brand as an entity. Then in addition to an archetype, excuse me, you can also look at building and defining your brand personality. So your voice is, it's really a, a, an adjective typically, and it's how you describe how you talk about yourselves. So are you lively? Are you positive? Or maybe you're cynical. Maybe you are a very professional entity and you talk professionally, or maybe you are bold, or you're very serious, or are you youthful? Uh, I've worked with some arts organizations who I would absolutely describe as being whimsical, uh, spiritual, rebellious. How you talk about yourself and the adjectives that you use to describe how you talk about yourself is what it means to establish your organization's voice. At the same time, you can have little variations on the voice. So, and, and we call that tone. So tone is the specific flavor that you add to your voice based on the audience that you're speaking to, the situation that you are in, or even maybe the channel that you're on. So there might be a, so now that does not mean that in one place you're going to be professional and in the other, you're going to be whimsical, right? We don't want to do that. We want to pick a primary voice, but then we can apply little subsets to the tone. Uh, if you think about it this way, you know, all of these components go into defining your organization's voice. So what kind of character are you? What kind of character do you have as an organization? What kind of language do you use? Are you using very simple language or is it complex? Is it savvy? Uh, I was working the other day with a, a pharmacy and oh my gosh, they were so complex. Uh, they were using this jargon filled language even uh, and we were trying to simplify things for them and, and make it more relatable. Um, and then you can adjust your tone maybe in one place you're a little more humble in another place you're very personal um i i see tone change a lot in on social media so the way that you may um express your voice on uh you know facebook or on instagram might be slightly different than if you have a tiktok account uh you know you're again you're either going to be stick with the the professional or whatever it is but the, the, the little tones that you use might change just a little bit. Um, and so if you've never spent some time thinking about your brand personality, it's absolutely worth the time and effort to do it. And that's because there's an economic reason to doing good storytelling. First of all, storytelling is 22 times more memorable than facts. And 56% of nonprofit followers on mobile and social networks report that they will take further action, primarily making a donation after reading a compelling story that has been published by a nonprofit. So there are good economic reasons why we want to invest in telling stories about our organizations. Now, I'm in a, in a room full of story lovers, I am guessing. And so I 
don't need to spend a ton of time talking about story structures, but because the slide is here, I will share just a little bit with you as a refresher. So the, the, these are two of probably the most common uh, storytelling structures that are out there. I'm going to, it's a, there's a little asterisk up there because I'm going to share a third with you here in a bit. But of course we have Freytag's Pyramid. Freytag's Pyramid uh, is you know, probably one of the most powerful and yet simple storytelling frameworks. Uh, and and so many of the stories that we read, the movies we watch, the, the songs we listen to, everything follow Freytag's Pyramid, right? There's an exposition, a point of conflict, the rising action, which reaches a climax. Uh, following the climax, there is, there's, you know, the falling actions that the fallout from the climax, and then the story ends with some sort of a resolution. Uh, all of uh, all of Shakespeare's plays are written according to Freytag's Pyramid, all of Aesop's fables. It is the most common storytelling method. Then we also have the hero's journey. The hero's journey was developed by um, uh, Joseph Campbell. And Joseph Campbell was a professor of comparative literature or comparative religion and comparative mythology. Uh, and he developed the hero's journey form of storytelling. Uh, and I, I always, I think the easiest way to think for me about the hero's journey is to think about superhero, uh, superhero storylines. So, you know, if we think about uh, Thor, for instance, when we start the journey, he's in Asgard. He literally leaves one world and crosses a threshold to come to another. Uh, he meets a mentor or a guide. Uh, the, he faces trials and tribulations. There is growth. He develops the, you know, the, the, the hero, hero or heroine of the story always develops new skills. There is a death of who they were and almost a rebirth, literally, as someone else. They face great revelation. There's, you know, changes that happen for them and for the those around them. There's typically a point of atonement as well in the hero's journey. Uh, Spider-Man, right? There's no better atonement than with great power comes great responsibility. They take that gift and they return to, to a different world or a different place, almost a changed person, a death of who they were and a rebirth as someone new. Um, but you can think about how people who interact with your organization may experience the hero's journey. Uh, gosh, do you do a, ch a children's literature class where they come in and and maybe they they you know either have poor reading skills and you help them you know the access to books helps them to gain those literacy skills, or maybe it is that you open their minds to a whole new form of, of literature uh, and it almost changes who they are and brings them um, new experiences and return them to the to the world a changed uh, a changed entity a changed person and so. You can take the stories that are happening in your library and turn those into um, the, you know, use Freytag's Pyramid and the Hero's Journey to turn those into really narratives that help you change hearts and minds. Every story, regardless of what storytelling format you are using, every great story uses seven common elements. The first is a hook. You have to capture people's attention. Uh, some of the research, it varies a little bit, but they say you have about seven seconds in order to capture people's attention. Uh, that's typically when visiting like a website. If you were talking about social media, people scrolling through social media, it's even less. You have about three seconds to capture, right? Scary. Three seconds to capture people's attention. So you need a great hook. If you don't capture them from the beginning, they're going to swim away. You want to, you know, set out a great hook and reel them in. If you're looking for examples of great hooks, it's it seems like an odd place. But right now, I think that uh, LinkedIn has some really good examples of great hooks. If you go out and follow some thought leaders uh, related to nonprofits or related to, I'm, I'm certain there are great, you know, library uh, thought leaders on LinkedIn. Uh, I think that audience is doing an incredible job of writing good hooks that capture people and reel them in. So check that out. Uh, every, um, you know, every great story also has a protagonist. It is typically an individual and not a group. It's harder for us to 
be ourselves or to relate if we're talking about a group of people, but if we're talking about a person who has been affected by the cause or the problem, then it really, you know, helps us to see, uh, to see how uh, the work that we're doing is, is changing people if we're talking about a specific person. It needs emotion. So every story needs to make people feel something because when they feel something, we're going to compel them to engage and to and to take part. Uh, I think that the thing about emotion is that you need to have a little bit of emotion in every story that you're telling, really in every piece that you're sharing out with the world. Uh, I I think every story needs to have a message for the head and a message for the heart. So uh, it needs to really, you know, you might want to include some logic and gosh, if you're sending it to my house, my husband's the logic part of the relationship. He needs some facts and figures, uh, but you also need that great story to appeal to me. So especially if you're doing something like a, a fundraising appeal or, or a, a volunteer recruitment piece, you want to have a little bit of emotion and a little bit of logic. Every great story also has a villain. And keep in mind, the villain doesn't have to be a person. So uh, I, when I work with Solutions for Change, again, out of San Diego, the homeless shelter, their villain is the churn. And they've identified the churn as the, the, the cycle that keeps people in and out of homelessness. Uh, and, and they see it as really being oppressive to people uh, who are struggling. And so they talk a lot about how to defeat the churn. Uh, and it, 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 is, it has worked so well for them to identify the villain. So can you identify a villain? Uh, and again, keep in mind, it doesn't have to be a person. Then here's again the logic. So you need the heart part and you need the head part. You need that logic. Why does this issue matter? Why are libraries important? What do what do libraries do for the community? We all understand that because we're readers, because we're library fans, because we support the libraries. Um, but not everybody sees that. It does, they don't make those automatic connections. So in a lot of ways, we have to draw those lines. I see somebody had mentioned um, maybe some lobbying uh, and, and legislative things coming up. Uh, you know, just because someone is a state, the, a state senator or a representative doesn't necessarily mean that they um, can draw the lines to how important libraries are to the health of our communities. So oftentimes you're going to have to draw those, draw those lines for them. You have to help them paint those pictures uh, and you're going to use the logic piece of the story to do that. Uh, and every great story needs a guide. Uh, you know, where would we be without those important guides? Star Wars would not be the same without Han Solo, uh, or pardon me, without Yoda or Obi-Wan Kenobi as the guide uh, that really helps the, the hero to solve the problem. And every story needs a hero or heroine uh, that, you know, really uh, has a call to action that's going to bring the audience into the story and create that desired impact that we that we want to have. So I mentioned there was an asterisk on one of those last slides related to storytelling. And that's because I have a third form of storytelling that I particularly really appreciate. So this is my well-loved copy of the book, Building a Story Brand. This book is written by Donald Miller. I hope, hope, hope that you all have a copy of it in your libraries. Um, this book is all about how we talk to our audiences and how we tell the stories of who we are and what we do in a way that is simple and it is easy to understand. So Donald Miller, I think of him like a as a business guru. Uh, he has written uh, Building a Story Brand is my favorite. I have several other Donald Miller books back here on, on my little makeshift shelf. Um, but he has Business Made Simple, Marketing Made Simple, Marketer on a Mission. I think he's just getting ready to release another one on coaching. Um, and he has developed, however, this story brand framework. Full disclosure, I am a story brand certified guide. So I have undergone trainings with Donald Miller and the story brand team to learn how to use this method of storytelling. And I use it all the time for the nonprofit organizations and clients that I work with. When we are thinking about the story brand framework, we want to identify a character for our story. Now, the character of the story is never going to be 
the organization itself. It is always going to be either the, the person that we are helping, or it's going to be the community as a whole. Uh, maybe if you're a foundation uh, supporting libraries, maybe the, the main character is going to be a donor, something like that. They are going to have a problem and they are going to need a guide. And that's where your organization comes in. When you are using the story, the story brand storytelling format, your organization is always going to fill the role of guide. Then ideally, you want to give them a plan. Uh, you know, here are the things you need to do to change your situation. Here, here are the things you need to do to interact with the guide to really, you know, move the story forward. We're going to call them into action. If they take that action, it's going to result in success. If they don't take that action, then there's some sort of failure. There's a consequence to not taking the action that we're calling them to take. Um, if you can go through and identify each of these seven parts of the story brand framework, then there's almost like a mad lib uh, called a brand script. And you can take those ideas, flow it into the brand script, and it is going to tell you how to talk to that specific audience. A couple of things that I love about StoryBrand, it is very audience driven. So often as, uh, as community-based organizations, we think of all of the things that we want people to know all of the things that we do. And it, and that's that's what we're thinking about is everything I want everybody to know, but we're not thinking about what it is that they want or need to hear. Uh, and when we flip the script and we think about how we can tell them the information in a way that meets their goals and achieves what they want and need to know and care about, um, then our messages are so much more effective. And it also helps us to clarify how we talk about our, ourselves. This is another concept that comes from Donald Miller. It's in both the um, Business Made Simple book and Building a Story Brand. And this is the concept of a one-liner. Now, the one thing that I don't like about the one-liner is that it is not one line. So that's just my little pet peeve. But I don't know how you name something, something that it absolutely is not. It is not one line. It is typically two or three lines, no more than three. Here is what makes it unique. You are targeting this toward the audience that you're speaking to, and it is always presented in the same format. So a one-liner is presented in this format. Here is the problem, the main pain point that you solve. Here is the solution, the way or what you do to solve it, and the result, the positive experience that is going to occur as a result. So this is just an example of one that you might use for, uh, say, a Habitat for Humanity uh, organization, for instance. There are thousands of people in our area without access to affordable housing problem. At Habitat for Humanity, we help local families with home construction or repair to ensure access to safe, sustainable, and affordable housing solution. And when families have homes, they are safer, happier, healthier, and better able to be a thriving part of our community. Result. Problem, solution, result. And it should be so easy that a second grader could read that and understand who you are and what you do. When you can talk about your organization in this way, you are achieving the maximum impact and the maximum ability to be able to interact with your audience. So the next thing people will ask me is, Kirsten, all of these great story, these storytelling methods are fantastic. What in the world am I going to write stories about? So this is slide 33 in the slide deck. And this is what you're going to write stories about. Your founding. How did your organization come about? Every organization I've ever worked with has a unique story about their founding. Uh, and again, even, you know, libraries, I think so, so often they came out of the Carnegie uh, family resources and, and Carnegie libraries across the country. But how they came to be in your specific community is going to be a story that is unique to you. Tell stories about the people that you serve. Uh, you know, who who is it that your organization is all about serving? 
Tell stories about your donors or your funders or your supporters, people, you know, the people who have their card carrying, you know, library members and library fans. Um, tell stories about your volunteers, your staff or your board, uh, your sponsors or your vendors or your community as a whole. And I think especially with something like a library, how does the community look different because of the work that you do? Uh, you know, how does our community change? What would the community look like if you weren't here providing the services that you are? And so often, um, again, people just don't think about that impact. And this can really help people to see how you impact their lives. And then where are you gonna share those stories? So you can always share those stories on your organization's website. Uh, if you have a blog or a newsletter, anything like that, you can share stories there. Um, you can share stories in just regular social media posting or in social media, you know, like organic posts, or if you do social media advertising or even website uh, advertising. Uh, you can share stories, have your friends share a story. If you go to the work and the trouble to write a story, um, then you, you know, then you can definitely share that story. Tell a friend, you know, you have everyone that you work with share the story. Uh, if you've got a, a book club that meets regularly at the library, make sure that they're sharing their sharing those stories as well. So get as much uh, leverage and, and usage out of those stories that you're writing as you possibly can. Uh, and then, you know, think about maybe a blog. Can you share them on a blog you read or, or, you know, share them with someone else in the community, your local newspaper or something like that? Uh, or maybe even just messaging, uh, you know, send people a quick text message to, to share uh, a link to a story or a way that you can share a story. Now, the one thing that I would be remiss if I didn't include is a little bit of information about websites in particular and the important role that your website should be playing in your storytelling. So everything that you want people to do should point to your website. Unfortunately, we see a lot of organizations tend to send visitors away from their website in, instead of engaging them and keeping them on the site. So if you're sending, you know, someone to, uh, you know, a different uh, event, bright, for instance, to register for story time at the library, or you're sending them somewhere else to see photos or someone uh, somewhere else to, to, you know, register for an upcoming class or something like that then you're sending them away. And what we really want to do is to get people to come to our websites. And we want to make our websites the storytelling hub because you will always be able to control what goes on your website. When you are, you know, dealing with social media, for instance, you can't always determine what gets delivered to your audience. And so it's really important that you have a great website and that your website is the hub of the stories that you're telling on behalf of your organization. So I'm going to give you some examples of great storytelling that I've found online, particularly um, stories that are related to um, you know, or, or, you know, ways that we're telling stories, particularly related to social media. So a lot of these are social media related. So the first is, um, a website that tells your story again, you know, you want to have statistics and great stories on your website. It should be the main way that you are connecting with people. Uh, this is an example from court appointed special advocates. And you can see, uh, one of the things I love about this header on the website of this organization is it says your donation will provide a safer atmosphere. We're really right away connecting the people who are visiting our site to the work that we are doing. Uh, next, if you're looking for good examples of storytelling, maybe you aren't quite sure how to do this storytelling, follow Humans of New York. There is no one out there who is doing it better than Humans of New York. Uh, they started, uh, gosh, I want to say in like the mid to late uh, 2000s, their initial goal was to photograph 10,000 New Yorkers, and they wanted to have an exhaustive catalog of the city's people. Uh, what has happened is that they are now... They now have over 20 million followers on social media. They have featured stories in over 20 different countries.
industries. They are a great example of how you can use social media to tell stories with either single posts or, or you know, linked posts together. Their content is incredibly engaging and shared widely. Uh, so if you're not following Humans of New York, I see lots of uh, Humans of New York fans in the chat. I just saw a few of those pop up. There is nobody that does it better. Um, definitely, definitely worth, uh, worth a look. Uh, think about how you are, you know, telling the stories uh, of your organizations in a single post. So this is an example from my friends at the Lincoln City Libraries. Uh, I love how they combined this meme with, uh, with what's happening in their organization. So they're bringing things from the outside world into the library. We all remember Bernie Sanders at the, at the presidential inauguration when he's sitting in his little folding chair with his mittens on. He's got his manila envelope with him. Um, and they took that meme and turned it into a, a bulletin board to connect people again with what's happening outside uh, to, to things that are happening in the library. Um, so think about how you can utilize things like um, memes and those sorts of things to really engage people uh, with the work that you are doing. And then, you know, can you make social media posts out of it as well? I think that uh, telling your story is so critical on social media, especially if you can use photos to do that. Uh, so my friends at the Capital Humane Society every year have a Tales and Trails pet walk. And they have designated photographers that go around the pet walk and they take all kinds of pictures that day. Every year, I feel like I am the only person who has not attended the Tales and Trails Pet Walk because all my friends and their cute little animals are tagged in all of these photos and I feel like I have missed out. This is a great way to extend the reach of an event and to prolong the impact that an event has well after it is over. Um, don't forget to make sure that you get media release forms signed or that you have a public, um, you know, release, media release that's posted somewhere in your, in your building uh, that, you know, that basically tells people that that they um, are giving consent by, you know, sort of coming into the library, they're giving their consent to be um, photographed. So uh, think about that. Uh, but if you can do anything with photo galleries and, and libraries, that's phenomenal. All right, next is think about making sure that you have a call to action, whether it is volunteer, uh, read a book, donate, you know, check out a book, whatever it is, have those calls to action in your posts. This is an example from Solutions for Change. And you can see that they have, you know, the donate button, they have it circled, it is widely, uh, you know, widely shared and available. Um, they will even do posts, you know, this one in particular tells people three ways they can get involved, donate, volunteer, advocate. Uh, and so those calls to action are important. If you are on Instagram, uh, remember that you cannot post a link in an Instagram post because uh, th that's just how Instagram works. So if you're going to, uh, to use Instagram, you have to use that little workaround, which is click on the bio to learn more about this story or to, or to get a link. Uh, link in bio is how you get around that on Instagram. Uh, tell your story in an annual report. Annual reports are not just facts and figures. If you're working on your annual report right now and you might be struggling, let me know because we have an entire webinar on nothing but annual reports. Uh, and, and this is a great example of, from our friends at the Health and Hope Foundation who told the story about their uniform lending library and how successful that was in Tanzania. I think Make-A-Wish also does an incredible job of storytelling um, and also connecting their supporters to the stories that they're telling. So this is a, a good example of, you know, how you can help a kid like Parker climb to new heights. And uh, 12 ways that you can up your storytelling game. So the first is something I'm certain you guys aren't going to have problems with. You want to get something worth writing about. The second thing you want to do is to keep the main point the main point. The reason the Jason Bourne movies work is because Jason Bourne doesn't know who he is. It is not that Jason Bourne doesn't know who he is. And he was thinking about maybe getting a cat and he might go back and get his MBA. Nope, none of that happens. Jason Bourne doesn't know who he is. He's trying to figure it out. You want to find real life anecdotes and use those to tap into emotions. Ask your social networks to share. 
Uh, use one story in several different ways. Maybe post part of it on Instagram and part of it on Facebook and you post the whole story on your website and maybe you tell a story about it on your YouTube channel, something like that. But when you're going to the work to, to establish a story, use it in a ton of different ways. Then um, I love the story, the interview method of storytelling. Uh, so maybe you want to tell a story about someone who comes into the library all the time. Send them an email and say, hey, I would love to feature you, but I know you're super busy. So could I send you five or six questions and you can just answer them when you have time and send the responses back to me? Then when they send those responses back to you, you add an introduction and a conclusion, maybe mix things up a little bit. They've essentially written your story for you. So I love the interview method. Tap into experts. Uh, you know, get someone else to write the story. Uh, you know, you've got to have people coming into the library all the time who are, are great writers. Ask them to tell the story about how the library has impacted them or changed their life. Uh, use great images. Images are king. Uh, anytime, and video is even better. You can get video even better. Uh, compel people to take an action. Tell them what it is that you want them to do. Create a plan to follow up if you need to so that you know, you're know you not leaving people hanging. Uh, proofread everything. I am a horrible proofreader, absolutely awful, because I know what I want it to say and I think it says that when I read it. So I have to send things to proofing all the time. Uh, and then I love to make storytelling a part of your organization's culture. And I think this is really important. Uh, Lori Jacob with probably says it best. She's a master storyteller. And she says every staff member of a nonprofit should know a story of someone who has been helped by the organization. Our brains are hardwired to think in terms of story, to tell ourselves a story so that we feel something. And when we feel that, we can make a decision and take action on it. Um, I think that making storytelling part of what you do on a regular basis is critical. Uh, when I was the executive director of the Big Brothers Big Sisters affiliate in Lincoln, we would start every single meeting that the organization had, staff meeting, board meeting, uh, trainings, whatever it was, anything we did, we started with a mission moment and we told a story and it got our entire staff, our board, everybody got in the habit of looking for stories. And we started to incorporate storytelling into who we are and what we did. I would even keep a list of stories on my phone so that when I was out talking to people, I had a whole list at my fingertips to be able to share about the impact of the work that we did. Uh, and that's what the culture you wanna create within your organizations. So the first thing that you can do is to discover your voice and, and learn how to implement the right tone for your organization. Select a couple of protagonists and think about how you can tell their story. Document your founding along the hero's journey or, you know, pick a pick a, someone else's story that you can tell using uh, the Freytag's pyramid or the hero's journey. You can interview five individuals that you serve and ask open-ended questions. You can utilize your um, content management system to make your website a storytelling hub. Use social media to share your stories and then finally keep learning. You can attend. We have a ton of webinars from Firespring. They are all free of charge and we are always happy to share those with you. Uh, if you're feeling buried and you don't know where to begin, uh, because you're doing all of the things, I know what it's like to run a, an organization on a shoestring. Uh, we recommend that you let your website do the heavy lifting and dig you out. It is not coincidental that Firespring has an incredible website tool. We have some great libraries uh, as well across the country that use our Firespring websites. If you're interested in learning more, don't hesitate to reach out. We would love to answer those questions for you. Uh, we, in addition to websites, we do marketing, we are a full service printer, we do mailing, we do strategic guidance, all of these services all under one roof. If you want to learn more, just reach out. Uh, you can get a free storytelling ebook. Hey, Chessa, will you throw the link in the webinar chat? Oh, you already have. Look at you. You are she reads my mind. Here is a link in the chat for your storytelling ebook. You can download a free ebook to learn how to do more storytelling. And you can also learn more by going to firespring.com slash webinars, and you can sign up for any of the, the incredible, I think we've got about 20 different webinar topics that we offer. Uh, please feel free to go in and sign up for any of those. We would love to have you join us in the future. And that takes me to questions. So what do we have in the questions panel? 
All right. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. And actually it was one of your sure. one of your webinars um, before how I found this one and, and then contacted Chessa. So that was really great. Awesome. Um, so one of the questions that came in is what are some tips to showing people in the community that the library is not just beneficial in general, but to them specifically, especially those who have not had any experience with libraries or haven't been in one since they were uh, young? Yeah. So I think part of it is um, you want to, um, okay, here, sorry, I just, I got distracted by the chat. People wanted the link to the ebook. I'm going to go back to that link because it's this weird thing. I keep trying to remember to make this a simpler link and I forget. Oh, go back. Oh, go forward. Sorry. I will get to that question. <laughs> There it is. Okay, Chessa has also put the link in the chat if, if somebody wants to find it. So um, I think the thing that we have to do is number one, we wanna tell a story about somebody who didn't know what the library offered and they ended up in the library and they had their eyes opened to that experience, right? So we can tell that story. Or we can tell the story about how when people learn to read, they're more civically engaged. Um, you know, they're more involved in their communities. They're more likely to be a part of what's happening in our community and what the advantages are for that. So because we live this work every day and because we see it when we're in, you know, when we work for community benefit organizations, we, we just naturally draw those lines ourselves. The community as a whole does not do that. So when we can tell stories about how we make those connections for people and we, when we can show how we change people's views, then we're opening other people's eyes at the same time. So hopefully that's, that answers the question, gives a couple of examples. Yes, thank you. Uh, another question. If someone asks you a question about yourself and wants to know your personal and prof your professional and personal experience, should you lead with your personal story or end with your personal story? Oh, that's interesting. Um, <laughs> I don't know that it matters. Um, I think if, if one feels more impactful to you than the other, I would end with the one that you feel most passionate about or that you think is the most impactful. The one thing I will say about personal versus professional is that if our goal is to get people to love our organizations and to connect to our organizations, we can't often do that through a personal story. So uh, as an example, I used to know someone who worked for a mentoring organization and he had a really impressive story about how mentoring had impacted him, but he would often forget to then connect his personal experience to how the mentors with the organization he worked for really, you know, how those mentors did the same thing for all of the other kids that they served. And so if you're going to tell your personal story, you want to be sure that you're still connecting that to the organization and connecting that to the impact that you're sharing. Um, and it's not just a story about you because then it, the impact of the organization gets lost. So if it, if the goal is really to focus on um, the organization as a whole, then I think, you know, think about how you're sharing your personal story. Awesome. Thank you. You mm -hmm. talked a little bit about uh, questions um, with interviewing people. Do you, can you give some examples of those um, five to six questions? Sure. I mean, I think part of it is there, there would probably be a couple of them that would be exactly the same for whoever you asked, you know, do you remember your first trip to the library? Uh, do you remember the first book that you checked out? What's the most meaningful book you've ever checked out uh, from the library? Uh, how, how is your life different because you use the library? Uh, so there, you know, there's a, a number of questions like that that you could answer. Um, if you know the person's story in particular, then ask something that is specific to them. You know, uh, gosh, I, you know, I know that this is your favorite book. Can you talk about what a difference it made for you? Or uh, how did this book that you checked out help you write your business plan, which has led to this successful business? Those kinds of things. So um, you'd want to probably have a list that are, are always the same that you can draw from like that. And then a list of questions that are, you know, that are specific to the person you're asking. 
And I apologize if those are dumb because that literally just came off the top of my head. No, so. I thought those were great. I thought those were great. Uh, Hopefully those work. <laughs> another another question for you. Uh, our library community has a significant Amish population. And although we have many of those patrons come in, they tend to be a little more closed off from engaging in programs and activities. They use the computers and check out books, but don't tend to sign up for the free events. So how would you suggest reaching out to an audience that has uh, a more than usual wall up? Boy, that's, that's tough. Um, I think the first thing I would do is if there are members of that community who have gotten involved in events, I would ask them what it was that prompted them to get involved or how they came to be a part of those events, mm -hmm. because you might be able to take some of those same reasons and translate them. I think the other thing is really meeting people where they are. Mm -hmm. So obviously with your Amish community, you're not going to be able to send them emails or those kinds of things. So it's probably going back and creating, you know, taking your newsletter that is an electronic newsletter and printing off a handful of copies so that you can hand those um, to folks who might not, you know, might not go online and read it or might not have access to email. So I think it's a combination of taking those folks that you know maybe have been involved in, and using some of those tactics or some of the reasonings for them and then making sure that your message is accessible and that it is, it's really honed specifically for that audience. You know, what yeah. are the benefits you can provide specifically for that audience? I, I do think establish, establishing that trust with, yeah, you know, those one or two or three people is also, is also really key and having that, having those people be sort of that conduit uh, to yeah. everybody else, I think is really key. Um, so we are just about out of time, Kirsten. Is yeah. there anything you want to add before we close or one question I'm asking to um, all of our presenters kind of on the spot. And I know uh, you are not um, in the library profession per se, but one thing I'm asking is um, uh, why if someone came up to you and, and said, I'd like to, I'd like to work at a library or, or I'm thinking of beginning work in a library, um, why would you encourage that? Or what would you, what would you say to that? <laughs> um. Okay, not to be overly cheesy, and I really do mean this, <laughs> librarians are like defenders of democracy to me. You know, we, access to books and to knowledge is something that we should never gatekeep. And so I personally think that those people who are working to get knowledge and information and access into the hands of people in our community is an incredible thing to be able to do. And so um, that would be my, that would be my, my uh, message. Uh, there are a lot of other reasons, but um, that, that's my main reason. I think you, what you guys do is incredible. And I think that our country is stronger because we have for decades had access uh, to free and, and open communication and information. So thanks for what you do. Thank you. And I don't think that was a cheesy response at all. I think that I thought that was great. Uh, so thank awesome. you again, uh, Kirsten yeah. and Chessa for being with us. Thank you all for your participation. As I mentioned before, yes. uh, the, the recording and slides will be up on our website and we will have a short survey at the end of the presentation. When we close today, we appreciate the time um, that if you could take a few minutes and fill that out. We have one more webinar today in the marketing tract, and that is coming up at 2.30. Uh, it's called Get to Why, Stop Taking Orders, and Become a Marketing Guide. So that should be a great way to end our day and to end this track. So I hope to see some of awesome. you there. If not, uh, have a great rest of your day and so long. Thanks again. Thanks, guys. Bye.